All right, as we're, we're getting started, I do want to say that this is a sensitive topic that we're going to be talking about today. Um, there will be some references, ju just to be up front with you, there will be some references to some rape and incest. So if that's something that's a triggering thing for you, I just want you to be aware uh, ahead of time. And uh, I won't be offended if you have to leave. So just want to put that out there. Um, so this is a, a very sensitive topic, at least in my mind, that we're going to be talking uh, about today. And I'll be honest with you because I try to always be honest with you. Uh, I had the idea that this was a topic that needed to be spoken about and that God was really putting it on my heart. It's part of the reason we're doing this whole countercultural series and looking at things that the Bible says that are counter to maybe what society as a norm or cultural as a whole teaches on. And uh, I've told some people this, but the reality is, uh, while that was some of my intent or my thought going into it, originally this was going to be a sermon that was further up earlier in the series. And I was just like, man, I just, I don't know. Um, so I pushed it back. And then to today. And I had already told Keith, this is the topic, this is what we're going on. And then I started to go, man, God, is this really what I should be talking on? Is this really it? Because it can be divisive and has been divisive in the church and in the community uh, and in church communities and in society as a whole. And so is it really something that I should be talking on? And, and do I really even know enough? Maybe if I just wait. Um, it was that day that I stopped and had a, uh, I was on a sales call actually, uh, meeting with somebody I know and, and uh, was talking to them and they were sharing with me some of uh, some of what they have, one of their family members has experienced, and it was a child of theirs uh, that has experienced some hate and some bullying out of the fact that they were friends with somebody who who was a, a relative of somebody who was in a same-sex relationship, and uh, this person shared with me a real sad truth, which is that. Um, they said, I'm not a religious person. I'm not connected to the church. You do what you want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do, and we're all fine, um, was their approach. They said, but I'm really struggling with the fact that this is, the people that are, are bullying my child are people that are doing it from a point of spiritual authority, an idea of kids hearing from parents that are connected to churches and that, that are being told that that lifestyle is completely wrong, but not in a loving way as if it's one of a number of things that we can do that separate us from God, but that as this is some worse thing than other things. And really struggling with how do I approach these people when they think so strongly this way and have, uh, this wasn't their word, but the way they described it, almost a animosity or a hate towards people who don't think the same way. And that is crushing to somebody who truly cares about people. If you know anything about me, you know that I love people. And that's part of my reason for being hesitant to even go on this road and into this topic today. Because I know that it can be hurtful and has been hurtful and has been used as a platform to beat people. And I have a huge issue with that as a person, as a Christian, and as a pastor. Um, the topic today is around the idea of being gay and the Bible, homosexuality and the Bible. And I recognize that there's a good chance that there's people who are listening, who either have or are gay, people that may listen in the future that are gay, or have somebody in their family that they're close to, or a friend who is gay. Um, that includes myself. I have family and friends of ours who are gay, and I would never want to come across in a way that is hateful or anything but loving, because I don't believe that God would ever come across that way. I don't believe Jesus came across that way as well. So as such, that's kind of my long preamble to where we're at today. Um, I can't imagine being that young person that, that grew up wrestling with feelings of same-sex attraction, of trying to avoid those feelings, but feeling maybe hated by family, 
feeling that God may not love them if they had those feelings, feeling that they may be ostracized from their family or from their friends because of that. I can't imagine it. Or I can only imagine it. So, today, um, I, we're going to dig into this in more of a study format. For my daughter, who is home from college, this may feel like a college lecture. For the rest of you, you may think, I thought I got out of all of that and left that long, long time ago. Um, this may turn into a little longer message, which I, I know is already scary as it is. And we will try and move really quickly through the topics. If you have a note sheet, you'll notice that I don't have any fill in the blanks because there is a ton of information. You may be just writing as you go, or you may just want to take it all in. Um, we will record it. We will have it out there so that you can review it later if you would so choose. Um, we are going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians as a launching point. Just know also, as we get to this and as we get started, my, the end of my preamble here is I'm open to discussion on this afterwards. I acknowledge there's a lot that I don't know. I acknowledge that I'm coming at it from one perspective and I haven't been in other perspectives. But like with other things, I will tell you that I'm also coming at it from a perspective of I'm trying to just look at what God's Word says. When we talked about Sabbath, I said I'm not coming at this from a point of someone who's always had it right. Um, but as somebody who is learning and looking at Scripture, I'll say the same thing here. I'm coming at this from a point where we're going to go through what the Bible says, what God's Word says. We've said as a church that His Word is truth, and we're going we're to rely on His Word. So, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, through 11, and then 18-20. through 20, And it says this, Or do you know, not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed and you are sanctified. You were justified by the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Flee from sexual immorality and all other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against the body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Gracious God, as we get ready to dig in in your word, I am begging you, Holy Spirit, that it would be your words, not mine. And that as we look at this, that you would meet each person where they're at. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so like I said, we're going to cover a lot of information in a very short amount of time, relatively. Um, I say relatively because how many hours did we say we're in a week? And this is going to be like an hour of it. So um, hopefully less. Uh, I thought of it as I, a phrase I hate, drinking from a, water, uh, a fire hose. I hate that phrase. It's the idea, uh, uh, it's a cliche that gets used at a lot of conferences. Oh, we're going to throw all this information, you're drinking that from a fire hose. Well, it's going to be kind of that idea. And I was just thinking, uh, I was reminded of my dad when he, growing up, my dad it was a farmer, a dairy farmer. Uh, and when we lived in Florida, he did, uh, farmed in a large dairy operation. In this large dairy operation, they had... Uh, large fire hoses that they used to hose down the, the parlor. That's how they cleaned it. Well, this was back before all of the, you don't eat this, you don't do that, you can definitely not drink water out of a hose because it might cause cancer. It was before all of that, and so people drank out of this fire hose. Now, the reality was, if you turned it on more than a little bit, you would get drenched, and you would have very little of it go in your mouth. It would go all over you. If you turned it down very slow, though, you could actually drink from the fire hose. Unless a mischievous person jumped on the end of the fire hose and it would all of a sudden spray all of the water up into your face and you'd get drenched and very little of it would go in your mouth. Well, my hope is this isn't going to be quite like that in that there is going to be a lot of information coming at you, but that you're able to actually consume and take in what the Holy Spirit would have for you to take. Now, the truth of the matter is this topic of homosexuality 
or same-sex relationships or however we want to phrase it is something that's somewhat of a culture war. We talked about it not only outside of the church, but within denominations. It's been extremely divisive and extremely dividing in the church. And I don't use that term culture war loosely because as I was preparing for this, um, a, a little bit more background, one of the, the people that I, I learned a lot from and did a lot of research, and he shared his resources as he did it, was a pastor by the name of John Tyson. John Tyson is a pastor in New York City, uh, in the heart of Manhattan, and, um, and this was some of his research, and some of it's from his message. In fact, if you were to watch his sermon, you'd say, Sam, your sermon's a lot shorter, and doesn't have quite all of the elaborate detail referencing all of these books, but it's a lot of the same information. So anyway, as, as he was talking, and as I was researching, um, he used the term culture war. And I started listening to that, and I started to do a little bit of research on my own, and started looking at the things, not from a, not from a church side of things, but, but from an uh, outside-of-the-church research on, on what has happened in, a, in the U.S. specifically. If you're watching from outside of the U.S., this may not apply uh, as much. But inside the U.S., what has happened over the last 50 years related to same-sex marriage, same-sex relationships, how has all that gone? And culture war seems like a very applicable term. If we look post-Vietnam, there was the Stonewall Riots. I wasn't around then. Some of you may have been. Um, but the Stonewall Riots took place in New York City outside of the Stonewall Inn, which was a, uh, a, a gay bar in New York City. And there was six days of rioting with police and rioters. And uh, there was a book that was written by a gentleman named David Carter. Um, it was this book. Uh, he was in the, the, he was there when it happened. And he talks about what was going on at that time and the culture that was happening. And one of the things that he says coming out of those riots is that some in the gay community were going to have a three-pronged approach moving forward. He, that three-pronged approach that he references is one was going to talk about psychology. The psychology was that, that being gay is not a mental illness and trying to change that perception. Number two was they were going to go after the laws of the land that said that it was wrong, illegal, and so forth, and seek to make same-sex marriage legal. And the third thing they were going to do was they were going to go after the church. They were going to go after the church to try and get the church to change their stand on same-sex relationships. That was their three-pronged approach. And following that, shortly after that, in 1973, we have the Gay Liberation Front, they literally declared a war on normalcy where they wanted recognition of same-sex relationships. They wanted the same rights for people within a traditional marriage as in a same-sex marriage. Also in 1973, we have the American Psychiatric Association removing homosexuality as a mental illness because previously it had been. In 1977, we have the Save Our Children crusade in, D in Dade County, down by Miami, and uh, that's a crusade to, to uh, basically block gay rights in Dade County. It goes through, it's passed, it's later reversed, and, and those rights are reinstated in 1998. In 1981, there's a rare pneumonia and skin cancer discovered in gay men. It was called Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Disorder. Now, not long after uh, that was discovered in California and New York among men who were gay or in same-sex relationships, there was a um, discovery of a heterosexual individual that had it. And so there was a push among those in the gay community to get that name changed so that it was no longer going to be known as GRID or the Gay-Related Immune Deficiency System because it target, a disorder because it targeted or singled out gay in that name, and instead they changed the name to AIDS, which is what you would all know it as today. In 1982, we see Wisconsin as the first state to legalize, um, to, I'm sorry, to outlaw discrimination based on 
sexual orientation. In 1988, we see the AIDS epidemic lead to a conference. And this conference that it's, it's led to is called a war conference. Think it's not a culture war? The goals of this conference were, that came out of this conference, I should say, was that we need to desensitize people to same-sex marriage. We need to jam up our opposition, and we need to convert or change popular opinion. Uh, there's some quotes, I think I have them in slides, I don't remember, um, from a book called After the Ball. And this was stuff that came out of, out of that war conference. A continuous flood of gay-related advertising presented in the least offensive fashion possible. If straights can't shut off the water, they may at least eventually get used to being wet. Another quote that was there, the main thing is to talk about gayness until the issue becomes thoroughly tiresome. And a third one, uh, seek desensitization and nothing more. If you can get straights to think homosexuality is just another thing meriting no more than a shrug of the shoulders, then your battle for legal and social rights is virtually won. After that, we see uh, in 1993, the military adjusts its approach. Some of you, many of you probably remember this, where we go, at, at where the U.S. military changes to a don't ask, don't tell policy related to uh, sexual preference. In 1996, in what I would call a twist of irony, President Clinton signs the Defense of Marriage Act. If you were around during his presidency, you may know why I call that a twist of irony. But anyway, um, he did, and that was saying marriage is man and women. 2010, a federal judge says gay and lesbian marriage is constitutional right, and then 2015, uh, it is made legal in all states. Are you seeing the reality over time in our country where this has been made into a culture war? As a result of this happening in our culture, what we see is that it will affect the church. And by the church, I'm not saying the rescue church, although it does. I'm saying us as believers are impacted because it's what's going on in the culture and we should not be oblivious to what's happening in the world around us. Now, as we look at these controversial topics, there, there's something that has to be considered, which is how do we react to them? Because that how is so important in how we engage a culture war that's happening around us. In uh, about 2012, there was a book written called Unchristian. It's written by a man named Dave Kinnaman with the help of Gabe Lyons. And uh, in this book, there's a survey that asks the question of uh, young people, an upcoming generation, a generation that would currently be probably in their late 20s to early 30s. Um, there's very few of you in this room that are affected by that. Um, but there are a couple. But there's a, the, that generation was asked a question about what you know of the church. Or what is the first thing you think of when you think of the church? Now, it wasn't asked to people who were part of the church. It was asked of people that were not connected directly to a church and to the body of Christ. And when they asked that question, the number one thing that they knew about the church, anybody know what it was? It was that the church is anti-gay. That was the number one thing that people outside of the church thought of when they thought of the church. We're talking about people that are young people, people that are in a generation that are in their 20s and 30s now. They saw the church as being anti-gay. They didn't know us as being loving. They didn't know us as being caring. They didn't know us as a group that, that is out helping people to see that there is a God that loves them, that wants to have a, give them a hope that is only available through Him. No, what they saw... Number one thing they saw was a group of people that were anti-gay. Church, that is a problem. What's even more scary is the, the rate at which they saw this. Of all of them surveyed, do you know the percentage? If you were to guess, what percentage do you think had this answer? Give me a guess. 90%. It was 90% of all of them surveyed. Do you know what the number two thing was? 
It's a little bit embarrassing as well. It's, we were known for being overly political. Church, I think there's a problem. Now, I would love to say that, yes, that was 10 years ago, and everything's changed, and we've got it fixed. But if I said that, I would be completely lying, and if anything, we are that much worse. Because that division has gone more and more and more even into the church to where there's fighting in a church, vocal fighting in a church that carries out into the streets over both sides and of sex, same-sex relationships. So, that's a pretty long intro to get to a point where we need to look at what the Bible says. Because clearly there's people trying to influence our perspective in general. What does the Bible say? If we are going to say that the Bible is God's word, and as the rescue church and as, as your pastor, I will say the Bible is God's word. It is, it is unchanging from the beginning of time. It is inerrant. There is no error in it. So if that's true, let's go back to his word. And let's see what, what the Bible says. Now what we know about the Bible, I love this quote as I was, as I was um, preparing. It was one of the things John Tyson said. He said, the Bible is the invitation of a loving God to enter into a loving relationship with him. That's what God's word is. And the gospel is that same loving God sending his son Jesus to earth to make that relationship possible. That's what the Bible is about. That's what the gospel is. So let's look at these passages. I'll tell you one that is debated on both sides because one side, one group of people says it means one thing. One says it means another thing. Others say it means something else. We're not going to look at Sodom and Gomorrah because it seems like that truly wasn't the purpose of that text. So that one's out if you're wondering if we're going to that. We're going to start in Genesis. We'll start at the beginning, work our way through. In Genesis 2, 18 through 24, we introduce the, or God introduces the sexuality of humanity. And he says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground of the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see that he, what he would name them and whatever each man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, the wild animals, but for Adam no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place, where, uh, uh, the place with flesh. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my blood, she, blood flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now there is a view, uh, some would call it the progressive view, and this progressive view would say that, that what God was saying is that the animals weren't enough, Adam just needed another human being. That's really what was being said here, and it just so happens that this human being was female. Now, if we review the language, and I don't remember who this was attributed to. I think it was a guy by the name of Preston Sprinkle. Do I have this, Miriam, on the slides? Uh, is there a... a that starts... A, a, here we go, here we go. Okay, so this will give you a comparison, because I was going to try and explain this, and I thought... Seeing it's probably easier. So the Hebrew word konegdo is suitable. And K, so konegdo is the word that's used as suitable. K, as or like, and neged, opposite, against, or in front of. So, so that's what makes up the word suitable. As opposite him or like and against him. Eve was the perfect partner for Adam if it were simply Eve's humanness that, and then obviously switch, made her a helper, then the word K, like, would have been just fine. The verse would have then read, I will make a helper like him. I will make a helper K, him. But to make the point that Adam needed not just another human, but a different sort of human, a female, God used the word konegdo. This word potentially conveys both similarity, K, and dissimilarity, neged. Eve is a human and not an animal, which is why she is K, why she is like Adam. 
But she's also a female and not a male, which is why she is different than Adam or Neged, opposite him. We see that in that text, Adam needed a woman, not just another human. We also see in that text, there's a, it says, for this reason. And this lays out the reality of, of Adam and Eve that's later referred to in the New Testament. We'll get to that later. Now, I've often said, and hopefully anybody that you've heard teach will say, you can't look at the Bible just in one passage or you will miss the meaning of all of it. You have to see all of it in context. It would be easy for me to take this passage out of context, and if this is the only passage that I was teaching from, be able to say to you, this is what God said, and leave some doubt in people's mind, go, okay, yeah, that was his, his plan then, but what about New Covenant? How did things change? What happened? We'll get there eventually, um, because we're going to continue looking at more texts. Uh, as, a, as a side note, and this is important, because as the church, if we're honest, we've gotten a lot of things wrong. As, as the church, one of the reasons I think that, that people can um, question our stand on what it means to have a same-sex relationship and what the Bible says is because we've gotten some things wrong in regards to women, in, a, in regards to slavery. Even in our country, we see the same thing where, where in our country we talk about, about one nation yet we've divided it into different groups and we've had all sorts of division and we still have different division. So it's understandable that people might question this idea if we just base it on this one thing and say the church has changed, things are changed, they don't know what they're talking about, so let's keep going. What I was going to say before I got off on that little tangent and is this side note related to women. And it's interesting that there's other stories of the beginning of time from other religions, other places. It is only God, only in the Bible, only in the Torah, where we see that woman was created also in the image of God. Others will say that man was, but only our Bible says that women were created in the image of God. Anyway, uh, continuing forward, comes the idea of, okay, like I said, is, is this a prescriptive thing? Is this God saying this is for everybody? Or is this descriptive as a matter of this is what's happening in that time? It's an important question to ask. Let's move on to Leviticus. Now, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you love the book of Leviticus? How many of you skip the book of Leviticus when you're going in a Bible in a year plan? Okay, some of you are lying. Um, we're going to go to Leviticus, though. We're going to go to Leviticus 18.22 and Levit Leviticus 20.13. Leviticus 18.22 says, Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Leviticus 20.13 says, If a man has sexual relationships with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are put to death. Their blood will be on their heads. In context, God is giving the people a way to holiness. He's giving them a, a set-apartedness description of what it looks like in Leviticus. Now, you may say, well, some of this was directed towards priests, and so that's different. Well, I will direct you then to Romans 12.22 that says, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are a royal priesthood. So I would tell you that this probably applies for that reason. But, but I'll give you a, a better reason than, than that. There are three parts of the Old Testament law. And one of the things that people do, myself included, I reference this with... Um, Sabbath, as we say, yeah, but that was then, this is now, that was Old Covenant, this is New Covenant. God has, Jesus in his coming to earth has replaced the Old Covenant, he's fulfilled the Old Covenant, therefore we are not subject to any of the things that happened in the Old Covenant. So the, the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, is broken into three parts. Those three parts are ceremonial. Those ceremonial parts were related to the religious uh, ceremonies, that were related to forgiveness. It was the, the sacrifices. It was the, the celebrations. It was uh, the way they were to treat the temple. Remember in this passage that we started with today, as Christians, that temple doesn't have the same 
same um, relevance in that at that point, that was where they went to meet God. And in, in the New Testament, we're told that God dwells in his people. There's a change that's part of the reason that that ceremonial law doesn't, doesn't still matter. Because of, the, because of Jesus, we're able to go directly to God. We don't have to go through an intermediary. But because of Jesus as our intermediary, intermediary, we do not have to go through someone else. So ceremonial law is replaced. Part of the law is the civil law. The civil part of the law was the law that was set up for them as a theocracy. If you are not familiar with what a theocracy is, that's fine. A theocracy just means that it is a nation ruled or governed directly by God, not through other people, but directly through, directly from God himself. And so those things no longer apply. That was the children of Israel. That was then. But then there's a third part, and that third part is the moral law. And the moral law still applies. We see those are things that we've talked about over recent weeks as we've gone through this series where we see that that Jesus doubled down on things like like adultery. He he talked about giving. In fact, it wasn't just him, but we see others talk about giving. We, We see in him talking about Sabbath and bringing Sabbath to the forefront. So it wasn't only... Uh, Old Testament, but we see Jesus, we see Peter, we see Paul bringing Old Testament moral code, moral law into New Testament. That carried past Old Covenant into New Covenant. So, the next question then to be asked is, okay, so if we're saying that it still applies... Is Leviticus just simply feminizing the partner? Meaning, like a woman, not necessarily a woman. So a question to ask is, would God reference like a woman, saying that the person is lesser, if when we look back in Genesis, he says that both man and woman were created in his image? There's a question of, is it victimization? Yet, in this situation, in, this, in these passages in Leviticus, what we see is they put to death the person that commits the sin. Yet, if we look back at... at uh, uh, sorry, which would be both of them in this, to finish my thought... They put, together, they put to death the people that were committing the sin. But what we know from Old Testament law, that book of Leviticus that none of us like to read, I should say Kristen likes to read, none of the rest of us like to read, um, that Old Testament law talks that if this was a case of somebody being victimized, both people weren't put to death. The person that committed the crime, the rape, the person that committed it was put to death, not the person who was raped. As such, it seems like a stretch to say that this would be implying even the person being victimized would be put to death. A third thing that we see is that as with a woman appears to reference Genesis 2, where the woman was created to complement the man. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward here into the New Testament. So in the New Testament, we, we know that one, one of the debates, one of the challenges in this is to say that, that Paul and the New Testament church didn't know same-sex relationships as you and I would know them. It, it was different then than it is now. And I'm not going to say everything was the same because things change. And, and we know that things change. Things are different now than they were 10 years ago than 20 years ago. So I won't go to that, but let's go to some specifics on, on what people claim. Some, some of the claims in this, and you've probably heard them, is that really what God, or Paul in this case, God through Paul, is speaking out against is a, a master-slave type relationship. Or an older person taking advantage of a younger person situation. Now, why we know that that isn't the only type of same-sex relationship that Paul and others know of 
is because we can look outside of the Bible and see references to this time period that reference, uh, again, same-sex relationships. Uh, one of the books, C.A. Williams, a book called Roman Hex Homosexuality. That one's by Oxford Press. There's another one by K.J. Dover, The Greek Homosexuality. That one's on Harvard University Press. No one would accuse either of them of being overly conservative, uh, I don't believe. And uh, yet they talk about, in their books, about sexuality, that yes, they do talk about those other types, but that homosexuality was something that was known about. In fact, one of them references uh, uh, Pleiotis, and I don't know anything about Pleiotis. I was just reading from this K.J. Dover, I believe is the one I was reading at. And it talks about homosexuality with mature male on, and with two mature males. This is talking about referencing things that were from that time that aren't related to the Bible. So based on not stuff within the church, but outside the church, we see that this wasn't a new concept or a twisted concept from us looking backwards. However, and this is an important however, one of the things that people get tripped up on, and one of the reasons we, we trip people up, is the terminology homosexuality and heterosexuality. Because the reality is, that, sex, that, that terminology is new in about the 1900s, I believe it was. So part of the, the confusion comes from us saying they would have talked about homosexuality when they would not have probably used those terms or something similar to them. They would have said male with male, female with female, something along that line. Like I said, much more like a college lecture than a typical sermon. All right. Let's go to Romans now, and uh, that's where we're going we're gonna to head next. And this, this text shows that all of us are condemned to being separated from God except by His grace and forgiveness that Jesus offers. That's the concept of this, this entire text. It's not specifically related to one type of relationship. And I think we need to be mindful of that, that, that often um, the reason people who in that 90% came up with those things about us as the church is because we've pulled out one part of a passage that talks about many other things and have focused overly on that one area. We're going to specifically, though, continue down this road because that's our topic for today. Uh, Romans 1, 24-27, where it says, Therefore God gave them over to sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is ever to be praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men abandoned their natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, if I was to come at this with a more progressive-leaning view, more, um, no, I don't know the right term, uh, but hopefully you get the idea of what I'm saying. Um, it seems that, that, that they could be talking only about lust or exploitive sex outside of a committed marriage, a committed relationship a committed monogamous relationship. Now, there are people who are gay and Christian who would say, but that's not me. That's not us. We are in a committed relationship. And I would say that there are people who that would apply to that would be able to say that yes. In fact, there's probably people in same-sex relationships that are more committed to their marriage than some people who are in heterosexual relationships. That's probably true as well. But Paul seems to be referencing something a little different here. Um, Paul makes reference to the Creator and creation. And uh, there's a slide that's going to be up here, and so you'll learn one of the things about me if you haven't figured it out. I like all text to be the same on slides. It's a real pet peeve of mine. But it would be hard for you to see all of this on one slide if I didn't make it smaller. So most of you probably couldn't care less. I just had to put that out there because this is probably a pet peeve of mine. But anyway, it says, uh, They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, iconos, in the likeness of 
homo ati, hmm? uh, of mortal mankind, anthropo, and birds, petiainen, that's why it's on there as well, because you can read it, um, and animals and reptiles, herpeton. All right, so that's, that's the, the part of what's from Romans. If we look then at what is in the, uh, in the Genesis passage, we see that then God said, let us make mankind, anthropon, in our image, icona, in our own likeness, homoisen, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea. And I'm not going to continue with all that. You get the idea that what we're seeing in this reference in Romans is a direct correlation to what God said in Genesis. Which causes us to look back and go, clearly what is being talked about here is not that idea of simply lust in general, but is talking about truly same-sex relationships. In Genesis 3, we also see the language that's there of a, a lie uh, of shame, a sense of death, um, all those uh, uh, allusions to the fall that come in Genesis 3 that we see in this passage as well. Okay. Um, so, so Paul is saying nature, but doesn't mean orientation. What he's really saying is as it was at creation. Romans 1 is not about heterosexual lust. And while rape and abuse was an issue at this time, it does not appear to be what Paul is talking about. Um, there's a, I think I've got this on the slide as well. According to one interpretation, and this is from a book by Lois Crompton, uh, according to one cor correlation, this is uh, not directed at bona fide homosexuals in committed relationships, but such a reading, however well-intentioned, seems strained and unhistorical. Nowhere does Paul or other Jewish writer of this period imply the least acceptance of same-sex relations in any circumstances. The idea that homosexuals might be redeemed by mutual devotion would have been wholly foreign to Paul or the early Christian. In 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9-11, through 11, in today's text, jumping to that, we see there's two Greek words that are used there. The two Greek words that are used there are melakoi, which means a soft material or something that's soft, and arsenikotoi, which is men who lie with other men. So those two terms are used. First Timothy says something very similar. It says, uh, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is, not, is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the holy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers or murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those who are practicing homosexuality, for slave traders, liars, perjurers, for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the, the glory of the blessed God, which is entrusted to me. In that passage, they use the word arsenikotoi, arsenik, now I lost it. Um, you know it, anyway. So, the, as we switch to the next slide, it's going to show you something that is interesting. And that's that part of the confusion that comes into these topics was created by people translating the Bible. Well-meaning. This is not a, a condemnation on any of them. It's a job that I wouldn't want to do, um, and I am not even remotely qualified to do. But what you will see is that the, the 1 Corinthians 6, 9 includes both of those words. The 1 Timothy 1, 10 only includes one. Um, in Christian Standard Bible, it was translated males who have sex with males. Uh, both were. Both that and the NIV have similar things except for 1 Timothy. Uh, it says uh, in the New, the New International Version, which is often what we'll use, those practicing homosexuality. In the men who have sex with men in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, there's a footnote in each of those referencing um, that there's passive and active participants. Uh, in the English Standard Bible we, uh, version, we see 
men who practice homosexuality. Holman, we see anyone practicing homosexuality. King James, we see effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind. New American Bible, we see boy prostitutes practicing homosexualities. New American Standard, we see effeminate homosexuality or homosexuality, homosexuals. You can see why there would be confusion about is the Bible really saying specifically same-sex relationships? Because when we're reading it as people who read English, depending which version we get, we are getting a different message. So, it's important to look at what the word really is and where that could come from. Um, the, the idea of men having sex with men or males with males is probably the best translation. It focuses on, and this is an important fact, it impo- focuses on the action or the behavior versus the orientation. Some have argued that the term soft is referring to call boys. In reality, what's probably happening is Paul's probably referencing back to the book of Leviticus. Uh, what's interesting is, is Paul was raised as a Pharisee. He was, would have been raised, um, in, in, we know that he was raised with strict religious training. As a result, he would have had to memorize most of the Torah, which is much of the, the Old Testament law. And so he would have known this and would have been able to call it from memory. The reason I bring that up is if we look at eight, Leviticus 18.22, <laughs> I'm glad I made a slide of this. Um, we see, in 1822, we see the, I'm not going to try even pretending to read all of that, but we see arsenos and coitin. In Leviticus 20.13, we see arsenos and coitin, re- referring to uh, the idea of men lying with men, men. It is believed by many that the word that Paul is using here, arsenokotoi, is actually Paul combining those two words into a word that any in the Jewish community would have probably recognized as a reference back to Levitical law and to the holiness code that was the moral part of that law. If Paul was actually, in fact, referencing boys as prostitutes or in a relationship with young people, there are other words that could have been used. In fact, we saw some of that by the fact that those other books actually do reference the fact that that was taking place so that we know that there was terminology to talk about that if he had. This is what uh, the book, What Does the Bible Really Teach About Homosexuality says. It says there were other Greek words that were widely used by Christians, Jews, pagans, and anyone else who knew Greek to refer to pederasty. For instance, the Greek word for pederates was widely known to refer to for the love of boys, as was uh, that other one, corrupter of boys, or the next one, seducer of boys. Jewish authors especially used the latter two terms to condemn the practice. Another pair of Greek words, aristes and aramenos, were often used to describe older men and boy lover. So, What did Jesus say about all of this? In Matthew 19, Jesus is addressing a question. He's addressing a question about divorce. And in that question about divorce, he actually addresses marriage. If you look at Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, he says, Haven't you you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined, let no one separate. Jesus is reaffirming in this the Genesis version of marriage. In fact, he is quoting directly from what was in Genesis. So those who would say, that Jesus never addresses the topic of marriage, I would argue he does under the conversation on divorce. So let's try and recap this and bring it all together to say, what can we get out of this? In Genesis 2, 
we see a creation account. We see that Adam needed a, a human that was different than him. He needed a woman. In Leviticus, we see that, that God wanted a holy people so that their rela- relationships matched what was intended in His holy and perfect creation before the fall. In Romans, we see a case about people rebelling against God in a multitude of different ways. And one of those ways is male and female relationships. Male with male, female with female. In 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, we see Greek language from the Old Testament, from the the Torah that is used to reference God's intent for marriage. And in Matthew 19, we see that Jesus reinforces the creation view of marriage. So, what does this say about marriage? Uh, I'll give you what I believe it says based on this text. You're going to have to make decisions for you. I can't tell you what to believe. But here's what I believe we see in this text. First, first let me say though, there's a lot of things I don't know. In fact, I was telling somebody this morning, there is a lot that I have realized as I've gotten older that I don't know that I would have thought I knew better when I was younger. So my learning will continue on this topic and then on many others. Second thing I want to say is that I don't expect people who aren't Christian to believe in the absolute truth of the Bible. With that, we see a loving Jesus who often approached people who were living in sin, including sexual sin, not in a way of looking down on them, but treating them as people. We see a loving Jesus approaching a woman at a a well who was a Samaritan, who would have been viewed as less than, who was living outside of a healthy marriage because she had had five husbands and the one she was with at the time was not one of those husbands. And yet we see Jesus approaches her with love, not with hate. So, in all of that, as a preference, I would say when we look at these texts, when we look at the Bible as a whole, we see that marriage is one man, one woman, united as one, for as long as both of them live. That was God's desire for marriage. Wrapping up, there's still a ton of questions to be answered that I haven't even touched on today. Um, and I've gone long, as you know. Um, there's questions like, are people born gay? There's different points of view on that, but many in the science world are starting to say that there's a good chance that they were. There's the question of, is this like slavery and women that the church have gotten wrong for so long? And I will pause on that one and say, I don't believe so. I don't believe so because it wasn't all of the church that got it wrong, but part of the church that got it wrong. I also will say it's not the same because it's very clear that that in the 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 slavery that it was clearly a different slavery. We, We can look back on historical studying outside of the Bible, just like we can for same sex relationships. And we can see that the slavery referred to was different in that time. And yet, for some reason, we took the Bible out of context. But there's a lot more questions to be answered around those, those topics, I'm sure. I won't pretend to answer them all today. Uh, can people change their sexual orientation? Gosh, I don't know. I, I truly don't know that if they can. I won't say that they can. Um, I'll say that, that I've heard people say that, that God has changed them. And I believe that's possible. But I will also say that I think some of the therapies that have been done are nothing short of abuse on trying to get somebody to change. Maybe well-intentioned, but pretty harsh nonetheless. Is same-sex orientation sinful? 
I'm, I will answer that one, and I'll say, based on what we see in the text, no. Because it's the actions that are the sin that God calls out in those passages, not the orientation. We can have more conversation on that. I'm just saying that's what, we, what I see referenced in that. And what about the hypocrisy of the church that is firm on this issue but lacks on other sins? I think it's a fair question and a fair criticism. As Christians and as the Rescue Church, people should know where we stand and it should be clear what we stand on. But I hope and pray people know more of us more what we're for than what we're against. That they would know that we are for a loving God who loves them and cares about them and cares about me and cares about you and wants to meet us wherever we are at. Whether it is a sexual sin, whether it is something related to uh, uh, stealing, whether it's something related to... In fact, if we look at the text from today, in the middle of all that... In, in, we, we singled on the sexual sin, the, the, the male with male part of the sin, sins listed there. Let me go through the, the list that are in that 1 Corinthians 6 passage. It also addresses idolaters, thieves and people who rip people off, greedy people, I'm sure that's none of us, uh, drunkenness, people who say things that are untrue about other people. Oh, that whole gossip thing comes in there. So, we as the church need to be careful that we are not getting on a pedestal and looking down at anybody, but instead that we are sharing a hope that's in, that is available because of Jesus. A love that God has called us to. Yes, God is a just God, and that's what many people have stood on their thing and said. But let's not forget that He is also a loving God who meets us where we are at. So if you are someone that is connected with us today and are gay, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you. Understand that, that we don't claim we have it all figured out and that we will say that we are all sinned and all of us fall short of God's glory. And I think it's also important to say and that all of us remember that God didn't make a mistake in creating any one of us. Regardless of where we would fall on that sexual orientation part of things, He didn't make a mistake. He created every one of us on purpose and for a purpose. There were no accidents. And through Jesus, there's forgiveness for all sin. In fact, if there is is a person that would be connecting with us today that doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, regardless of whether you are straight or gay, the reality is there is a loving God that wants a relationship with you. And lastly, as we get ready to close in prayer, I just want to say we want to be a loving people, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of whether it's something I've addressed today or not. Our desire is to be loving. I'm going to invite you all to stand and we're going to close in prayer. Gracious God in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus coming down to earth, living a life that I couldn't live, none of us could live, and facing the death that each one of us deserve to die, that we could have life that's available only through Him. God, I pray that today and throughout this week and in our lives that we would be a people who love those around us, that we share Your love with those around us. Not that we're scared to have conversations about right and wrong. Not that, that we are unwilling to call sin, sin but that we would be even more excited to call out grace and call out hope and call out new life that's available in Christ. God, we, I give you 
this service, this message, this time. And just ask that you would do with it like you will. In Jesus' name, amen. at therescuechurch.com or email us at office at therescuechurch.com.